everybody for coming. My name is Lauren Nellas, and I am the founder and the executive director of the Food Empowerment Project. We're an all-volunteer organization, so all of us um, have full-time jobs, but we also do this work on the side. And I just want to thank you all for coming, because I know this is a little bit different maybe than some of the other talks that are being offered here. Um, but this is one that hopefully that will resonate with all of you. Uh, how many people in here are um, vegetarians? I would imagine that some of you might be in because you care about justice and you care about compassion and the suffering of animals is what prompted you to change your diet. These are the same issues that prompted me um, to start the Food Empowerment Project uh, because it revolves more than just around animals. We talk about other social justice issues. So because this is the... Um, we also, this is just the support of um, Dolores Huerta, who hopefully many of you have heard of, who's the co-founder of the United Farm Workers. She started with, with Cesar Chavez, and one of the main, she's vegetarian, I'm sure many of you know Cesar Chavez was a vegan. Um, and one of the main um, areas that we work on is actually um, farm worker issues, which I'll be talking about. Um, but since most of you are already um, vegan and vegetarian, I'm actually going to skip over the whole part that I usually do on animals raised and killed for food. When I give this talk, it's usually to people who are interested in food justice um, who don't know about animals raising for food. So we'll skip that issue if you don't know about it. I'll be mostly talking about farm workers, environmental racism, chocolate slavery, water privatization, um, access to healthy foods, and then what you can do about these issues. And I have to tell you that some of these issues are much harder to work on than what we eat. It's not going to be as easy as it is um, to just go eat. So, like I said, I've, I've done a lot of investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses. Um, and so, it's very important just to always remember the animals. This is Quincy. He's a rescue duck who lives at Woodstock Sanctuary in New York. And I'm in love with him. And so, I always have to have him as a representation of why so many of us don't consume animals. Because it's exactly for animals like Quincy. Um, who are feeling sensitive beings who have every right to live on this planet without any harm. So, I know I really want to talk about animal stuff. I've done it for so long, but I'm going to go on. One more thing before I go on is how many of you have heard of AB 376? It is, uh, great. It is a um, bill that is on Governor Brown's desk right now. And basically it will ban the possession of shark fins in California. So basically, if you aren't familiar with shark finning, they basically capture these sharks in the wild and cut all their fins off while they're still alive, and the animals basically suffocate um, or are vulnerable predators uh, before they eventually drown. So if you haven't already, we're really asking everybody to have a pen and paper, please take down this number. We need you to call the governor um, and ask him to sign AB 376 into law. They've already passed some of the laws in Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington. If you've already called, I ask you to call again. You can also go to his website, and you can click on there. It'll have pro and con at the top. And you can write a message, or you don't have to write a message. And at the bottom, there's a drop-down menu, and you can click on AB 376, Possession of Shark Fence. And we need him to hear from everybody loud and clear, because if you live in San Francisco, and although I'm a nonprofit, so I can't really talk about political issues, but a certain senator who's running for mayor in San Francisco, Lily McGee, has been pulling out all the stops he possibly can to stop this bill from becoming law. He has enlisted the support of former Mayor Willie Brown to help him in stopping this from passing. So we need to make sure one, and I'm not speaking as food and power party, but if you care about animals, you probably want Lily McGee not to be the mayor of San Francisco. Um, but we really need you to call and make sure Jerry Brown signs this into law. This isn't a done deal. A lot of people look at Jerry Brown, say he's an environmental governor, we know this, it is not a done deal. And we wish that it was that easy, but we've been fighting very hard along the way to make sure this bill passes. Is shark fin used as a food, or is it a Chinese medicine? It's used primarily in shark fin soup at Chinese restaurants. But the wonderful thing about it is that um, even in places like Hong Kong and Taiwan, there, there's this big shift against it because the younger generations recognize that our sharks are in jeopardy. So anyway, we in California can have a huge impact if we can make, make this into law and get Jerry Brown to sign it. 
So please, I ask all of you to talk to them. It is toxic to high mercury levels, um, as are all sea creatures. Uh, okay, so the next part is, as a vegan organization, which is our main, one of our main tenets, we are, we are encouraging people to eat more fruits and more vegetables. I mean, that is what we're doing, just by nature, by encouraging people to eat a vegan diet. Our organization feels very strongly that we have a responsibility to those farm workers in the fields. It's very difficult to talk about the suffering of animals in factory farms and not acknowledge that the laborers in these fields are treated with absolute disregard and their rights are violated constantly. That is the norm of the industry. There's about three million farm workers in the United States. The majority of them are hired by labor contractors, which means that a grower hires a contractor, the workers take this, um, take the job with the contractor, they have to pay really high recruitment fees, um, and they are, they're basically accepting a lower than minimum wage job. And they're doing it why? Because they're trying to feed their families. And so we are trying to lend our voices to that of the farm workers to make sure that they're treated better, that they have their rights. A lot of times, um, they're not only treated badly in terms of labor, the fact that they, a lot of them live outside. They live in their trucks, they live in the peat in the forest. They um, are dying right and left of heat exposure in the state of California. Now the state of California is the only state that has passed anything for the farm workers so that they um, have some protection from the heat, meaning that there should be shade or they should be given breaks. We're the only state in the country that has this, and yet, we still have had about 11 plus farm workers die in the state of California just to heat exposure since that passed. No one's enforcing this. There's not even a real desire to enforce it. A few years ago, a young farm worker, 17 years old, um, died. So she was pregnant, she was 17. And what happens is they have these water stations, but they only have a certain amount of time to take a break. So by the time the person gets to that water station, the break is over. So it's better for the workers to not even bother taking the break. They get paid by the bushel, by whatever it is that they pick, that's how they're getting paid. So there's no incentive for them to stop working because they need to make as much money as they possibly can. So in addition to the fact that these farm workers are treated with no respect, no dignity, they work eight to 14 hours a day, they have, um, higher is incidence of respiratory problems because of the agricultural chemicals that are used. We also have downright slavery occurring in the United States, where farm workers, when they enter this country, whether they be from Latin America or Thailand, they have their passports taken away from them. So as soon as they enter, what they sign is they sign a contract with a contractor that says, okay, so this is the job you're gonna have for six months or a year, and the contractor takes their passport as they come in, as they've taken this contract, which they think is a law-abiding contract, they find out that the job is really only for three months. And they're like, so the contractor will say, oh, your job is only good for three months, so all the paperwork you just filled out is legally binding you here? So now it's over, it's only three months, so you can go back to your country where you've just invested all this money in the recruitment fees, or we can give you another job, and now you're an undocumented worker. Because now you no longer have the paperwork. And more than not, they're gonna say, not only because of that, because they don't have their passport anymore. There's been stories of actual convictions in Florida where the judge has actually said, this is slavery. These people are locked in 18-wheelers. They, they have no way to communicate. They're put into locations where they don't even have access to telephones, no way to reach anybody. Food, water is dropped off to them in these remote places. And I shouldn't say, this, this type of stuff also occurs in um, raising um, cows for beef in certain parts of the country as well as sheep where the sheep herder will have a little house in the middle of nowhere, and they just drop off food and water. So he has no way to get more food and water, except from the people who come and drop it off to him. And unfortunately, this is endemic in the US. I mean, we're not talking about another country. We are talking about the United States, which constantly points the fingers at other countries about slavery, and yet we're here treating farm workers like this in our country, who are the ones who are actually providing all of us food, not just vegans. They're providing everybody with food, and everybody needs this food in order to stay healthy, and yet we treat them this way. One of the other things that I learned about recently, we went on a, a tour of um, 
the farm workers, actually. And we actually went to one of the labor camps. And I don't know about you, but whenever I hear the word labor camp, I kind of think back to Grapes of Wrath, and I picture how everything was back then. Although it doesn't look like that anymore, what's happening here is that these labor camps are paid for partially by the state of California. Our tax money goes to paying for these labor camps. And this is where the farm workers live. Only 12% of the farm workers can actually live in these labor camps because there's just too many farm workers and there's not enough labor camps. But the thing that gets me about our tax, I'm not a big like our tax money paying for this. What I have a problem with is that we're subsidizing this because the state knows that these farms are not paying these people a living wage. And that's outrageous. We are actually saying it's okay that these people don't need to be paid a living wage. We, we know that they're not paying them enough to actually afford to have a place to live. And we're subsidizing. This is corporate welfare, if we've ever seen it, just to justify the growers not paying these farm workers a living wage. To add to that is that these farm workers, these, these labor camps, they can only live there from November to May. So if these workers have children, what happens is kids are able to be in school, a lot of them are born in the United States, November through May, and then they have to leave the labor camps. They not only have to leave the labor camps, they have to move 60 miles from that labor camp if they ever want to live there again. So that means these kids who are in school, all of a sudden they can't go back to school until November, and they've already missed some of the semester, some of the me me ugh, sorry, months of learning, and they're immediately at a disadvantage of the other students. And yet, this is what we're paying for. This is what the state of California is endorsing as okay. So we feel quite strongly that we want people. We have a, we have a table here, and we have a sign-up sheet. We echo with other organizations working on these issues. Not only the United Farm Workers, but the Coalition of the Immokalee Workers. If you haven't heard about their efforts against Trader Joe's, who's not willing to pay the workers um, who pick their tomatoes a living wage. You know, people, if you're not going to boycott Trader Joe's, you need to let Trader Joe's know how you feel about this. You can find information on their website through us or go directly to the seat IWF. But we need to make these corporations accountable for how they're treating these people who are picking our food. We also, um, we're also trying to work with other organizations, trying to figure out a way to solve this labor camp problem. There's an attorney who tried to work on a bill, he's in Santa Clara County, and we work with a doctor, a professor actually, who works with a lot of the farm workers. When we actually went to this labor camp, one of the things, part of the tour, is that you donate items to the families, and you donate school supplies, not anything you're supposed to buy, other than school supplies, or clothes, and I remember this one little boy was so excited by a pack of pencils. And it hit me, like, how many kids would be excited by a pack of pencils? But he wants to learn, he wants to do good, he wants to succeed, and a pack of pencils symbolizes that. So one of the other areas we work on is environmental racism. How many people here are familiar with the term environmental racism? So basically, environmental racism is where one portion of the population is at a disadvantage in the other portions of the population, which more than not is communities of color. Communities of color in the United States, and actually around the world, um, are disproportionately affected by it. So an example would be my example that I just gave of the labor camp. The labor camp we visited in Salinas is in between a dump and a correctional facility. A lot of the factory farms that we look at are actually located where communities of color live. In North Carolina, almost all of the pig farms there are located in African American neighborhoods where they do not have a high income level. So these farms are able to get away with whatever they want to get away with. These people have nosebleeds, respiratory problems. I've investigated pig farms, and I can tell you that after the investigations, two showers did not get the smell of the pig farm out of my hair. Um, and these people can't open their windows because of the flies and the stench. Their property values are pretty much worth nothing. That's why they try to locate themselves in poor communities. In the state of California, we have the same thing with our dairy farms. Majority of our dairy farms are located in the Central Valley, which is predominantly Latino. They have the highest rates of asthma. Um, Fresno is called the asthma capital of the world because their, their asthma is so high, not only just because of the dairy farms, but also you have other pollutants. But dairy farms are a big added <coughs> problem to that. According to the EPA, California's biggest environmental crisis is actually the dairy industry. 
We have hundreds of thousands of cows in the state, and they're corroding our water supply. Even these quote-unquote happy cows that you see, they're mostly on the hills, and all the defecation runs down into our streets. Majority of cows in California, as I'm sure you all know, are not anywhere near grass. Completely on, um, in the Central Valley, there's nothing but basically that. Oops. Okay, so this is when everybody's going to be like, oh, I hate you. But, um, <laughs> and if any of you picked up chocolate on your way in, got some information for you. So basically, one of the big areas we focus on is chocolate slavery. And one of the big reasons why is because I saw a documentary from the BBC back in 2001, and they interviewed one of the workers and one of the, called the worker, one of these slaves in one of these farms who had escaped. And they asked him, the interviewer said, um, if you were to speak to a Westerner right now, what would you say to him? And he said, I would tell them that they're eating my suffering, they're eating my flesh. And as a vegan, that stuck with me. That's the same thing an animal would say, you know, when you're doing this, you're contributing to my suffering. Does this apply to your cow? I'm sorry? Does this apply to your cow? This is cacao. This is all cacao. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so basically it's the cacao bean, which we all call the cocoa bean, but technically it's the cacao bean. And so this is what these young children in Africa, um, basically they use these large machetes to cut out the cacao pods and they pull them down and these are very heavy, they get beaten if they don't move fast enough. These are small children, usually the ages are like 12 to 17, but children as young as seven have been found out there. Um, and they, they, get, they get beaten if they are too slow carrying these heavy bags. Um, a lot of the young children have scars all over their bodies from these heavy, these machetes, which are incredibly heavy. But also, these workers are locked in at night. Um, if they try to escape, they're beaten or they're killed. They don't get paid. A lot of them are either, well, they come from, so a lot of the kids, or a lot of the people, I should say, think that they're going to get a good job. They're told you're going to get paid, well, come take this job. So that's how some of them get there. Others, unfortunately, speaking in very poor areas like um, Burkina Faso, very poor areas of Africa where the children are actually sold sometimes by maybe maybe a woman says that the, her brother-in-law can you watch the boys, I'm gonna go and do this. He's actually sold by the uncle into slavery. Other times they're actually just kidnapped off the streets. And this is what they do. Um, and this, is, this isn't anything that chocolate companies don't know. Every single chocolate company knows about this. There's no denying it. Hershey, all these other big corporations talk about, oh yeah, we're part of these teams working on it. When the fact of the matter is, all they would need to do is pay them a living wage. They pay the, pay the farmers a decent wage for the beans, they can pay their workers. If, if these million dollar corporations aren't willing to pay them what they deserve and what they earn, they're not gonna ever be able to pay these workers to be so at Food Empowerment Project, what we did is we created a list of chocolate companies. We, what we've been doing is we've been contacting all companies who make vegan chocolate, only vegan chocolate, and we asked them to tell us where the cacao beans come from. Unfortunately, um, there was child slavery found in some of the fair trade fields. So we do not advocate for fair trade off the bat. We don't just say it's fair trade, it's good. We can't do that because of that problem. And we feel bad saying that because we know fair trade is doing the absolute best that they can. In fact, when they found these children, the slaves, basically, the little girls in, in one scene, you can actually watch this all online. Uh, we have all linked from our chocolate section on our website. They actually took the children out immediately and placed them in the school. So the fair trade people are doing what they can, but it's, it's too much of a problem in certain areas. So we do not recommend any chocolate that comes from I, the Ivory Coast of Ghana, period. No matter what, those two places in the world, which of course 75% of our chocolate comes from there, is just too, slavery is just too endemic there. There's no way, we feel comfortable at this point, until more of these fair trade cooperatives have had a few more um, audits where they come up clean, we can't recommend them. 
So these are all companies. What we do is we contact them once, give them the opportunity to respond to us. If they don't respond, two weeks later, we remind them, hey, did you get this? Two weeks later, we give them a final email and say, if we haven't heard back from you, you're going on our bad list. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of the vegan companies have ended up. Straight up vegan. I mean, obviously, the list is vegan, and it just meets, like, alternative baking company. Um, and they, they will not disclose. They won't even respond to us. Companies like Cliff Bars. They won't even disclose where they get the chocolate from. Now, this is a company that we have known to be very good at so many other issues. And yet, when it comes to the chocolate issue, they refuse to disclose where their chocolate comes from, which, if you're like me, that casts a shadow of doubt. Why, we as consumers have a right to know where they're getting their beans from. We have the right to, even if, you know, obviously it was because they, you know, they say it's proprietary. But look at Newman's Own, which is a huge corporation. They're disclosing. They actually were one of the quickest companies to get back to us. And I don't know, Jocks is on here too, and they have a table up there. So you guys should go and get some of their stuff. Because they're the best, and we totally love them. Um, but um, Cliff Bars won't even tell us. They're saying it's proprietary. Well, we don't know how all these other companies are going to be proprietary and Cliff Bar list. So we're actually wanting everybody who buys Cliff Bars, but we don't want you to be like Cliff Bars that much anymore. But we're wanting you to ask them, why won't they just close this? You know, it just makes me more suspicious about where they're getting their chocolate from. And we'll probably have more information on that if you sign up on our email alert list. Um, we have a sign-up sheet at our table. We'll probably be talking more about food bars in the coming months. But we really do, I mean, we feel this is an area that we as vegans, we get this stuff. We get why it's wrong. And we can use our, our purchasing power to make sure that these corporations do the right thing. Another area, another vegan product, yet yeah, one that we do not encourage people to buy is Coca-Cola. Um, not only are they privatizing water in places like the Chiapas in India, uh, meaning that they're trying to own water supplies. They're, so that basically it's cheaper for the people to buy Coca-Cola than it is for them to even get water. Outrageous. They also are responsible for killing union workers in Colombia. And I should add that we are selling our water supply in the United States too. We're selling it to Nestle. So this is more information we have on our website but, um, on water prices water privatization and why you know discouraging people to buy from buying bottled water not only because we shouldn't be paying for water and the plastic but it's because these corporations are trying to own our water supplies and unfortunately in certain countries it's much harder for the people to fight back against some of these situations like we came here that as people who want to protect people in Mexico and in India we cannot buy from companies like do they still support bullfighting as well? I don't know. I always just say they're everything bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, they probably do. Uh huh. If you only care about animal rights, yes, they still do support them. Um, so one of the other areas that Food and Proper Project works on um, is food deserts. Are you all familiar with food deserts? No. Basically, it means in certain areas where access to healthy food is not available where you have more liquor stores and fast food than you have healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables. And talking about this issue, I really thought it was a US thing. I really thought this is, this is something that happens here. But I spoke recently in Canada and also in New Zealand, only to find out it happens in those two countries as well. The one similarity is that it's always, almost always communities of color um, who are impacted, or in the case of New Zealand, in Canada, it's the indigenous people who are more of a disadvantage than anybody else in terms of access. Um, this is actually, I spoke at Thurgood Marshall High School. I don't know if you are familiar with it. Forest area here in San Francisco, where they have higher rates of health, of health disparity and health-related um, diseases than any other part of San Francisco. They're a pretty desert. When I spoke there, I asked the students, how many of you know or do you have, uh, have family who have diabetes? in over half the room. Clearly, I think only a couple students didn't raise their hands. Access is a problem. So what we did in Santa Clara County to highlight the problem is we went out, again, we're not a volunteer group, we went out and we surveyed over 200 locations in Santa Clara County, liquor stores, convenience stores, grocery stores, 
on the availability of healthy foods. So we surveyed them on fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, frozen fruits, frozen vegetables, canned as well, as well as vegan options, dairy alternatives and meat alternatives. And also took note of other things like how late are they open, how many you know, liquor signs do they have in the windows, things like that. And what we found was that no surprise. I mean, this wasn't a surprise, right? That we, we, we knew that the higher income areas were going to have better access. Um, pretty much the lower income communities had no access to organic. And not only is that important to us because of the agricultural chemical side of it, that people shouldn't be consuming the chemicals, but also because of the fact that we should have a right to, to not consume products that impact farm workers. We have an ethical right to not support that industry. Sorry. The other thing we found out uh, was clearly that they had more access to everything else. It was really interesting going into the grocery stores in lower income communities. They really didn't even have a frozen department anymore. You know, it was just like little ice cream areas. But they didn't really have like frozen corn or green beans or anything like that anymore. At least in the areas that we surveyed. A lot of the canned items were expired by years. Um, all the, the fruit drinks and everything were expired as well. I just heard about a new law in California about that. Because a lot of groceries sell expired baby food and kind of food. They're going to be fine now. Which they're, they find them just horrible. In person. In person. Um, and no surprise as well, we found out that the access to meat dairy alternatives were um, pretty disproportional. And why, so two things on this for us. Me, obviously for us, we don't want people consuming animals. We feel that um, animals, you know, suffering is enough. You know, that is the bottom line for us. But if you want to look further than that, if we want to make the argument to policymakers, the fact is, is that we know that meat and dairy are correlated to heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. In our communities, communities of color, have higher rates of all of these problems than any other representative portion of the population in the United States. We are disproportionately impacted by diabetes than any other um, meaning African Americans uh, and Chicago's. So in terms of dairy, a majority of people who are people of color are also lactose intolerant. Over 90% of Asians are lactose intolerant, 80 to 85% of Chicanos, and 90 to 90% of African Americans are. So what's happening here? So basically, they are forced to consume foods that are making them sick, right? I mean, to us, we call this food apartheid. And a lot of people don't like us using that strong of a language, but it is. When you have one population of people who's completely denied access to food that's good for them, it's apartheid. It's, that's exactly what it is. So our feeling is that um, the lower income communities we need to make create some awareness about this. We need to make sure. And to their credit, there were a couple of, if you can believe it or not, there were a couple of um, liquor stores who actually had soy milk there. They were in the higher income areas, but they sold soy milk there. And we're like, okay, so it's possible, right? These little tiny convenience stores can sell dairy, non-dairy. This is the other thing we found out was that if you look at the the chart on your left, if I was the USDA. Or say I'm a grocery store and I'm like, okay, what areas should I go into to open up another store? I look at the higher income areas and low income care income areas in Santa Clara County, and I say, there's pretty much not much difference, right? There's only a percentage point of difference between how many grocery stores they all have. But when we actually went out and surveyed, all of those little markets that are basically liquor stores are masquerading as grocery stores. They're actually classified as grocery stores. So even though you walk in and it's pretty much a liquor store, but they may have chips and a lot of them have sardines and things like that, it is still being classified as a grocery store, no different than Safeway or Whole Foods. And I'm trying to get somebody to pay attention to this nationally, because this is a federal issue, and you know, a volunteer little group are having a hard time getting anybody's attention. But this is part of the problem. The other thing we're trying to work on is that in the lower income communities, the pricing for the produce wasn't there. So we would go into the grocery store as we would do survey everything they had. We'd walk in in the convenience stores and they would have a little bushel of bananas there. We'd say, well, how much for the banana? And they'd be like, eh, a dollar. 
But a different person would go in and be like, eh, 75 cents. So that means that, that these people in the lower income communities are not only probably paying more than other communities, but they're up to the discretion of whoever it is that's behind the counter. So we've been talking with an assembly member about possibly introducing legislation that produce at least has to be priced. Because if, also if you don't speak English, how likely are you going to be to ask somebody to price something? And these are foods that everybody needs to be healthy. And they don't have them a lot in these communities, so if at least the convenience store has them there, they should at least be trying to make sure that they're accessible to people regardless of the income level. So, I'm sure I forgot a lot of stuff, but we're going to go over the what you can do. The best part of this is just Q&A so people can talk about this. So as you already know, we want you to go to the So next, what we want is lend your um, voice to the farm workers. Now, this is the tricky part, right? Because I wish I could tell you, we have a list on our website of all the farms that are, treat the farm workers well. We don't have that. Union labeling is not that available, unfortunately. Um, there's just there's only one farm. Even when we went on this tour um, of the, with the farm workers, the only farm that we knew of was Swanson. And they, make, they do like strawberries. They're in the Bay Area, luckily. But in terms of treating the workers right, we don't know. Um, all we can do is make sure that you know we put out alerts, um, which we feel are in the best interest of the farm workers and other groups are promoting to help get um, legislation passed. Um, so we try and do that. We also, um, you know, there's always speaking to your grocery store about it, speaking to the people. You know, recently I made a big mistake. So all these learn from my mistakes. We were at the farmers market and I asked the guy. So how are how are y'all treated? Do you work on the farm? And he said, Yeah, it's awesome. So are you treat you paid an hourly wage. And he looks over at this other guy and I realized he was a farmer. And so the guy was like very evasive with everything I asked him. I was like, okay, lesson learned. You know, so it's just like it's tough. I mean, but we have the right to know, right? If this reflects your values, just like veganism, if it reflects your values to make sure that you're not participating in suffering, if our organization oppression is oppression, no matter what form it takes. We have to fight against all injustices that are out there. So we need to use our voice as well for the farm workers. So that's the one I don't have an easy answer for you, other than to help us when the legislation comes up on any level and then speak to your stores about if they can start sharing. Even Union, even though they're going to tell you there's not a lot, there is some. We will probably be putting something out on Union candy for um, Halloween, uh, which we did kind of do. Obviously, buy organic food. Now, organic doesn't mean the farm workers are treated any better in terms of their housing or their wages or anything, just like farm animals, right? We know that just because a cow is an organic farm doesn't mean the cow is treated any better. It just means they're not exposed to all those other chemicals. Same thing with the farm workers. So we encourage the people just to buy organic when you can because that's one less bad thing to happen to the farm worker. Just one less bad thing for them. And I know that organic can be expensive, and so we encourage people at least, you know, once a week. You know, when you go out, at least slowly try and buy more organic if you can. The only chocolate that is free is slavery. So again, um, we're trying to find somebody who knows how to do apps. So if anybody knows how to do apps or knows somebody, because so many people have to print, um, like Ellen, one of our volunteers, was telling me I should print our chocolate list when she goes to the grocery store. And it's really hard, and we know that. We, we want to find an app so it's easier for people. But we update our list practically every single week, because people will email us and say, hey, what about this company? Or um, our volunteers will find chocolate in different grocery stores and say, hey, can you check into this company? And again, just because it's fair trade does not mean it'll go on our list. So we encourage you to check out our list. Any of the companies that you like that's on our cannot recommend list, we encourage you to write them. Either tell them to disclose, ask them to respond to us, or encourage them to switch suppliers. We have had at least three companies that we're working with right now for trying to work with us on finding different suppliers. So they can be on a recommended list. Boycott Coca-Cola. I would encourage that to Coca-Cola, Nestle, Procter & Gamble. <laughs> the list goes on. We're, a new section of our website is going to be up hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and then speak out about the issues of food, in, food injustices, not only when it comes to the workers, also when it comes to the issue of access. You may see a lot, or you may hear people talk a lot about those people when they're talking, talking about people of color. Those people don't want to eat healthy. That's why they're overweight. That's why they have high diabetes. That's why this or that. Remind them about access. If you see it in the paper, write a letter about it and ask, well, what's the access 
the healthy foods like in that community. A lot of these people don't have cars. And so riding two buses and doing all your grocery shopping may not be the most practical. So we need to stop this um, misconception from going on. And then sign up for our alerts. Like I said, you can sign up on our website um, or go to our table and we have a sign-up sheet. Um, we also have a website called veganmexicanfood.com. And the recipes are in English and in Spanish. We're trying to translate our whole website to Spanish, but it's taking longer. Um, but if you have any recipes to donate, um, we take all recipe donations and we credit you on our website because I don't cook at all. <laughs> That's what my partner does and all my friends and my whole life because uh, I have time to cook. Um, and then we have our regular website, um, foodispower.org. I put some leaflets up here. We have more on the table. But all of these issues are covered more in depth um, under the Know the Issues banner. And each one, we talk more about also how we're exporting factory farms to developing countries and more about the slavery issues. And we also talk about factory farm workers and slaughterhouse workers. It isn't something that we actually go out and advocate on because at the end of the day, animals are still being killed. So it's, it's a conflict of interest for us. We still want those workers treated right, but it's harder for us to advocate because at the end of the day, the animals are still killed. But for farm workers, in terms of produce, that is our job to promote for them because we eat their food and we're a part of that system. So, I will take any questions. How many livestock are killed in this country? 10 billion land animals are killed. Oh, every day. Um, a million an hour. A million, I know 25 million chickens in a day in the United States alone. I know the majority of the young people. So 25 million chickens. We worked it out once, but I think 247 chickens a second or something like that. 10 billion land animals. Oh, yeah. That's that's US. 50 billion worldwide.
and you get home at night and it's past 9 o'clock and the only thing that's open is McDonald's because all your grocery store closes at 9 o'clock and they're all hoarded up. You don't have a lot of choices. And so a lot of them, all the studies that I've read, including in Oakland, which is where a majority, Detroit and Oakland is where a lot of this work has been done, as I'm sure you know, Carmen, with people's grocery. Um, a lot of this work has been done. It's access is a problem. These people, they want fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. It's just not available. Is it hold true also for the farm workers, the ones that are taking it yeah, yes. out of the field, that they actually Yeah, they talk about it. They talk about the fact that how, how ironic it is for them that they pick this all day, and yet they don't have access. What are you doing uh, on, on or around food day? Guys are uh, we were We considered it. The reason why we didn't is because they don't, they're include animal consumption, and so we decided not to participate. Really, because because you know two things, two two points about that. One is um, originally they had five principles, and I, I just got a publication that went to press. It had the five principles, and then they added the sixth principle, which has to do with the treatment of people that work in food processing and and, uh, and labor. And the other thing is they, they they I think they deliberately cast a broad net so that you do have. You know, the Michael Pollan's and the American House and people like that. But you also have T. Colin Campbell and, and other things that are, that are on board because they figure that's a way to try exactly. to manage. So, so another, myself as, as a vegetarian and vegan, one of the things that I'm trying to do in our organization is you know, reach out to people that are you know, not necessarily vegan or vegetarian as part of an ongoing education process. I, We're doing that more in communities of color actually is where we're doing the work, but for us to have our name on a website that also would include any type of animal consumption was just too uncomfortable for us. We just couldn't, we couldn't associate ourselves with it. And so, you know, it's tough for us, you know, I mean, we, luckily we work with a lot of food justice organizations in Santa Clara County and actually nationwide do a degree because they respect our work. But we're always, we can't join every coalition. We just um, unsubscribed from, I think, the California Food Coalition because of the fact that they sent out an alert that had a chicken on it. And I said, you know, we can't, you know, before you never did anything like that, but if you start to enter that into the equation, you can't be a part of this anymore. So we're in a very tough, like I always say, we're trying to talk to the vegans about human rights stuff, and not all of them want to hear it. We're trying to talk to the human rights people about veganism, and they don't want to hear it. So we may always be an all-volunteer group. And like, no one wants to hear what we have to say. So that's why I thank you all so much for coming to this talk, because it shows that you care beyond just that, you know, the veganism part. So any other questions? Um, what do the grocery stores say are the reasons why they won't open up in low-income communities, and how legitimate are their claims? Good question. They, um, most of them were there, um, and then they closed down. Even like in downtown San Jose, if you've ever been there, a lot of the big grocery stores closed down because um, the wealth started leaving the inner cities and going to the suburbs, so they went to the suburbs. Um, and there, they talk about the whole demand. Um, that there wasn't a demand for it. When really they realized they could actually charge more money further out in the suburbs than they could for the same food. When we actually did our survey, which you helped do, thank you by the way, um, we found some areas of San Jose where, San, so we did we surveyed all Santa Clara County, but all the poor areas were in San Jose. So we even found discrepancies in pricing between the same stores in terms of where we happen to be in the county. And actually, you would let, it was, there was no, we tried to figure out there's a way to see if there was something, something to it, but there really wasn't. There was no method of the madness. But anyway, a lot of them have just said that, they, that there was no demand for it, they moved out. Um, so that's why we're trying, that's why the next phase of our effort, which I talked about, the surveying, is we're going to go back with those impacted communities and survey the community what they want. Because what's happened too many times, and this is why so many efforts have failed, is because people go in and they say, oh, you need a farmer's market. And the community has no say, no input, no nothing in the farmer's market, so they don't go. They think it's for other people, not for them. And so we want to survey the community and say, what do you want? You know, do you want, do you want us to try and fight to get a grocery store here? Then we'll do that. Do you want us to get your convenience store to carry more fruits and vegetables? We'll, do, you know, we'll help you do that. Do you all want backyard gardens? There's a great group called Mesa Verde in 
San, San Jose, who helps people put backyard gardens, although they put them in the front yard so that all the neighbors can see all the yummy produce growing, and it encourages them to want to do it. It's a great program. So we just want to, we, you know, like if you get our report, we have the copies um, on our table, but you can download it from our website, um, where it's up to the communities. And that's part of the environmental justice principles, is that you don't go into a community and say, this is what you're going to have. You get the community to tell you what they need. And so that's how we're going about it. We're very lucky to have the support of our assembly members, our board of supervisors, and our city council members who are clear to the fact that we're a vegan organization because it's on our website, but they get this other aspect of the work that we're doing. Something recently I'd like to share with the notice of some people that are lactose intolerant. How do they eat raw? How do they eat raw? Have you had success in getting 
some of these smaller stores to carry some produce on a regular basis? There was success in Oakland doing that. We are doing, we're still waiting because we want to find out what the community wants. Because if the community says we want to have more of this in our convenience store, we need the community to have community discussions with whoever runs right. that yes. and clean it up, first of all. Yeah. A lot of these do, it's like you feel like some of these convenience stores, at least that we serve it, are trying. Yeah. You know, but we did find the rotten potatoes. We did, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the food's rotten. And then you would go to some of the Indian, the tiny little Indian stores, and they would have these beautiful, like, six buckets, and it would just be apples and all this delicious food, and they were able to do it. And it was like, these, this is the information sharing that needs to take place. Yeah, and so I agree with you. I feel like we're going to probably have better luck with that. Oh, I can see that. that. The community yes. has a committee, and they, what, you're the advisors, and they go. Exactly. That's yeah. kind of why and I then, feel like. Yeah, I don't know how produce is distributed, but I know uh, I've sometimes asked my local health food store to get an item, and they have to see if their distributor right. carries that item. We, with the produce, what we're, what we, my dream is for everybody to grow their own food. But like me, I lived in an apartment with my mom and my two sisters, and we never lived in a place that had any land. So I know everybody's not going to be able to do that. But I was at a meeting recently in East Palo Alto. What they did is they actually got the agricultural commissioner there to give a permit to five different people who were growing their own foods in their backyard so they could actually use one permit and sell this produce. So I'm hoping we can do something like that and actually start encouraging something like that because there's going to be more community support if you know that your money's going back into your community. Hey, yeah, you know, so-and-so grew this. I'm going to go buy his pears or his lemons or whatever it is. And that's what we want to see. And I have no idea what time it is. It's seven minutes of two. Any more questions? Well, there's somebody who was, we walked in was handing out chocolates. <laughs> so hopefully you will not take it on your way back. No, I'm just kidding. I really just encourage you, look at our list, speak out with us if you can, because you know it's going to be in the best interest of more of these eating companies to switch over to a better chocolate supplier. Thank you all for coming to this. Meeting.